Thank you and good morning to everyone. Um, we're all here because of innovation. It's what Silicon Valley runs on. It's what everyone in this room runs on. And I'm excited to be talking to a number of innovators and leaders in the audience. We're also here because innovation is an inherently human trait. It's something that defines us as a species, or does it? And so let's try and double click on that question a little bit. So Chris Anderson, the curator of, of TED Talk, um, said this, which I found very insightful. If you look at our history, brief history on this planet, every meaningful element of human progress has happened only because humans, multiples, have shared ideas with each other and then collaborated to turn those ideas into reality. Very much the case why we're here today. That's exactly what we're doing right now. And yet, it's so important because in recent years, it has become very clear that this is the only way that we can innovate. In fact, long are the days of the lone innovator who sits in a garage or a dark room and comes up with great ideas and all by themselves. We socialize ideas, we convince each other, we seek support. Our collective intelligence is built on exactly this premise. There's another reason why it's a very interesting time to be talking about this, and that is because we're now, maybe for the first time, beginning to think about the semantics of this uh, sentence. Specifically, what does each other mean? Is this humans? Or could that also include, for the first time, other entities that have capabilities of performing exactly this? Sharing ideas and helping create progress. Are we at the precipice of opening up the club beyond humanity to new innovators? Well, there's certainly a lot of motivation to do so. I'm sure you've seen some version of this diagram published by OpenAI um, over the past months. Talking about ChatGPT, I'm sure you've experienced ChatGPT. You probably know that it's gotten pretty good at doing a number of things. So it may not um, uh, specifically write your English paper uh, by, this, by itself, but it is very good at structured exams. It is very good at digging and sifting through information and providing insights. So the motivation for us to get closer, more creative working with AI is certainly there. It augments our abilities. As a previous speaker said, it accelerates us. And it's very, very true. And so for us to start thinking about AI, we need to be thinking about our interaction with AI. Can we collaborate with AI? In fact, ChatGPT maybe has made you or already invited you to think, um, are we spending more time conversing with AI than we're conversing with other humans? Um, down the road, maybe not in the long to distant future, will most of our communication be with machines and not with other humans? And if you're questioning my point, I invite everyone with a teenager in their house to raise their hands if they disagree. So learning to collaborate with AI has a lot of benefits, and, and, and we can explore a few. So how does collaboration work? Well, we've already established collaboration, if, uh, certainly for humans, works through conversation. And the, the process of conversation, the process of establishing collaboration through conversation is a process. In fact, it is a process built on trust. In, uh, in the 2014 book, Conversational Intelligence, uh, Judith Glaser actually described it as a five-step process for us to get from protectionism on the very left and being resistors, all the way to landing on the bottom right, a level three co-discoverers and co-creators of innovation. And this is for humans. But let's think about the, how this could actually work in the context of AI. How do we look at AI today? Well, certainly we look at it as a level one, low trust entity. We give it questions, tell me this, ask that. We question its answers. We use the term hallucinations, a term that, by the way, we're very comfortable when it comes to human hallucinations, but less so when it comes to machine hallucinations. And, and that's really where we're operating. How do we get to level two, level three, and could we one day become co-creators with AI? Well, that also has, a, has, has its process and also has its steps. In fact, the steps map to our human evolution and our biology. The very foundation of uh, collaboration and trust is transparency. 
you know, going back to our reptilian brain, if I don't see it, I don't trust it. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It's a danger. From there, we start experiencing emotions, and it's the, our emotional uh, context and interactions with another person, maybe even AI, that drives our heart brain. Is there candor? Is there personality? Are we compatible? Is there chemistry? At some point, we developed reason. So with reason, we started asking questions, why can you explain why I, uh, what, what a certain interaction happens or what you mean by your interaction? Can you make it available to me so that I can understand it? From there, we moved on to uh, recalling memories, episodic memory, turning uh, specific experiences into memories that are long-lasting because they're impactful. And finally, with our latest addition, our frontal lobe, we actually experience uh, aphoretic thinking. What if I was to do that? What would be the outcome of us doing and achieving this? What are the assumptions that would be used to make an outcome happen? And so on. So we want to land on the, on the very bottom right here with our AI friends. And to do so, we have to go through all these stages of trust and establish this intelligence, mutual intelligence. And if we do so, then we, start, we can start thinking about human and AI co-creators, our uh, human traits of intuition, of aphoretic thinking, of decision making, get complemented with um, software, really, machines, that operate autonomously, but can operate on very large amounts of data. And with that very large amounts of data in real time, in synchronous ways, can help us solve problems. But a one-to-one -one relationship is not the right way to think about it. It is actually a problem-solving network that we're creating, where multiple humans and multiple autonomous AI agents can come together to address very, very, very complex problems. And at that point of being able to trust in the decisions, to trust in the insights, to trust in the data streams and the interactions, we can start thinking about problem-solving networks as we have achieved a high level of conversational intelligence. In fact, trust is what takes our conversational intelligence, our ability to interact with natural language, and allows us to move to conversational design, mutually working towards specific objectives as peers. Design. So at Synopsys, we actually know a lot about design. In fact, for the better part of the last four decades, we've been helping companies, many of them in this room, build the latest silicon innovations in the form of an accelerator, in the form of a CPU, in the form of an automotive component, in the form of a dishwasher component, as we heard earlier today. And all these innovations are made possible through collaboration, direct collaboration with all these innovators out there as we address these problems. So now that we have our AI co-creators, we can start thinking about capturing all these design journeys as I said, four decades of design journeys that we've taken together. No longer are these design journeys lost to time and to complexity because we can capture neural networks on every transistor placed and every signal routed in these designs. And once we do so, this massive network of connection and information can be explored, can be explored by concurrently our human innovators and our AI uh, co-creators. And most importantly, accessed through a mechanism that's very, very dear to us, and that is natural language. In natural language, we can design the next chip, the next system, the next great product safely, securely. And as we think of this forward, really, this reality, is not that far off. The future is closer than we may think. At Synopsys, we started our AI journey um, really about six, seven years ago, inspired by machines that learned, taught themselves how to play complex games like chess, like, like Go, and based on the idea that one day we could have actual software that learns and teaches itself for that matter, to actually create semiconductor designs. The same semiconductor designs, by the way, that are used by the software to run and could be specifically designed for the next generation and the next generation of uh, semiconductor innovation. We announced our first
product, in fact, the world's first commercial product of, for AI for chip design. That same year, we received some very important recognition from the industry as a, a highly innovative product of the year. Um, really, within months, we had broken many productivity records. This one still holds. It used to take two engineers to design a part of a chip that we call a block. We now have engineers that can design 10 of them on their own without specialized knowledge about any specific part of the design because they rely more and more on our co-creator's ability to make things happen and to find better solutions. Wired Magazine, um, mid-2021, broke the story. The world's first AI design chip was a reality. It wasn't in a lab. It wasn't on a paper. It was actually in production and finding its way into people's, in this specific case, um, mobile phones. Samsung was our named partner. From there, today, many, many silicon innovators and nine out of 10 of the semiconductor top 10 actually use AI technology to design chips and accelerate the capability of their engineers. We have exceeded 300 commercial chips that are now in production designed with AI. And we've expanded the application space of all the different things that you can do from, for, with AI, from the very complex physical interactions all the way to architecture, verification, and test. And as we move forward, we see the future of innovation coming closer and closer, working with AI and humans together. Thank you. Uh, what would this mean for design services firms? And just as a disclaimer, I'm not in a design services firm, but um, curious, right? I mean, this is very impressive, 300 chips with a co-pilot. So what, what's your prediction? Well, uh, just like with non-design firms, we see a growth that I think we're all experiencing in the number of design starts, in the specialization of chips, and the absolute volume of chips that are going into different applications. A lot of the tape outs that I actually described happened with the participation, and in some cases, case primary role of design uh, services firms. Um, I think these problem solving networks that we see emerging are a natural fit for design services. Um, but we all, just like in every other segment of the, of the global economy, need to be thinking about our evolving role into those kinds of uh, interactions. So opportunity to upskill, opportunity to explore, opportunity to deploy new technologies is beyond an opportunity now, it's an imperative. Uh, thank you, very interesting presentation. Uh, quite quite uh, remarkable accomplishments. Uh, I was curious, uh, you know, digital design is more of a science, analog is more of an art form. Uh, have you been able to leverage uh, your AI technology for analog design? I love this question. And you're absolutely right. In fact, when you talk to digital designers, they'll say power, performance, and area, three numbers. You talk to analog designers, they'll say aesthetics and symmetry. How do I capture aesthetics and symmetry? Well, interestingly enough, there are many examples of AI being used exactly for the purposes of delivering aesthetically pleasing outcomes, exploiting the way that humans interpret um, a beauty, right, and symmetry. And the approach to make this kind of technology apply to analog is gonna be very different compared to digital. It is, all, it is going to be able to train on exactly those kinds of capabilities that human expert designers find as aesthetically balanced or pleasing, and follow the same kinds of capabilities to deliver to those new sets of metrics. Something that we haven't really been able to do before, simply because we couldn't enumerate those kinds of metrics. So very much so, and, and in fact, this is a capability that we have uh, uh, brought out into the market and uh, customers are engaged in, uh, we're seeing some very interesting results there. A lot of companies are still trying to catch up with AI design. What did you all do differently in your company that you all have such a remarkable achievement? Um, it, it really comes to a combination of culture, and um, a, a, a sort of a very pragmatic view of what's possible, what is attainable, versus what requires, you know, colloquially more baking, right? So a, in a, in a company that has an innovation of culture, and I very much see Synopsys as one of these companies, pursues 
solutions in the, in the leading edge of what's possible. The trick is to not overextend yourself so far out so that technology hasn't actually delivered enough pragmatic and economically viable solutions for you to be able to turn this from a technology innovation to a successful business model. And I think what we did successfully, and others have as well, is balance those two competing forces, right? The drive to be ahead, but also the consistency to, to deliver pragmatic and economically viable solutions. In this case, for example, we had to answer very early in our exploration of technology, what kind of compute environments would we actually be requiring to run some of this AI? We're talking 2016. Uh, e even between 2016 and today, access to compute and cost of compute has changed dramatically. In 2016 terms, we couldn't overextend ourselves past what was already available in the design environment. So we designed systems that leverage algorithms that operate at relatively low compute and with uh, a lot of determinism. Today, it's a different story. Today, we're looking at different directions at achieving this result. But it's the balance that always delivers the result. I think that's what we have time, Tom. Thank you so much for your, for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.